I think um, if you follow the headlines, what you're going what you see most are the disagreements, of course. So uh, that would be the place to start politically and atmospherically. That's what dominates the headlines. So disagreements between the United States and Europe on trade, on burden sharing and defense, uh, on Nord Stream 2. And, and those disagreements are not inconsequential. But I think you also have to see that in most cases, they're rooted in, in structural rather than temporary things, right? So in, in most cases, the disagreements between the United States and, and uh, at least many of the major European countries predate the Trump administration, and they're going to be here. They will be with us alive and well, whatever happens in, in November. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. The interesting question in my mind, Derek, I don't know how you see this, but I think it's whether America's relationship with Europe today is where it needs to be vis-a-vis -vis the main strategic challenge facing the United States, facing U.S. statecraft in our time. And that's the, I would say that's the challenge of great power competition and particularly the need to deal with the rise of China. And here, I think it is a little bit different picture than, than the headlines. I think, you know, clearly alliances should be our, uh, one, our greatest or one of our greatest assets for long-term competition with China. Uh, and specifically, I think the ability to, to rally countries of the West around unified or at least reasonably aligned agenda strategically and economically. We've, we, I think we've made considerable progress in elevating China in particular as a major point of focus for US diplomacy in Europe. Uh, we're a lot more engaged today in many of the regions that are most vulnerable in, in Europe to, to Chinese penetration. So Southern Europe, Western Balkans, Central Eastern Europe, Eastern Med. So I think beneath the surface, there is a lot more convergence between the United States and even the EU and some of the larger member states of the EU that we have disagreements with than is commonly understood. And the way I would put it is I think the elements are in place uh, to build out a more comprehensive strategic agenda between the United States and Europe. And it's a question of whether the next uh, administration in whatever garb will grab that opportunity and, and uh, it's gonna require give and take on both sides. Derek, I don't know uh, if that makes sense to you or what your views are. Yeah, I think, look, there, I think you're absolutely right that there are some underlying structural trends that have impacted the transatlantic relationship going back now across at least three administrations, because I, I carry some of this back to the, to the second Bush administration. And that uh, in some respects, the relationship is better, better than it sounds. Uh, and that if you look under the hood, and particularly in the security relationship, I would say, uh, you know, the work that began in the wake of 2014 and Russia's invasion of Ukraine and illegal annexation of Crimea in terms of the uh, European reassurance work that then was, cha was transformed into the deterrence work carried forward by this administration the increased uh, funding for U.S. force presence in Europe, some of the specific uh, deployment decisions that have been made. Uh, it, you could tell a story of continuity. Um, but yet there are examples and some pretty important examples for the transatlantic relationship that I think are not just structural uh, challenges. Uh, clearly a different administration, a Biden administration would have a different approach to climate change, for example, which is issue extremely important to, to uh, the European side, uh, very important, should be very important to the American side. And clearly an, a new administration is going to have a different approach uh, to climate change. Similarly on Iran, and, and Iran is an example that of, I, I would say of great US-European cooperation going back uh, uh, in the Obama years leading the JCPOA. I actually believe there was potential um, and West was part of some of this when he was in, in, in office, potential for greater cooperation with the Europeans who, who agreed with the argument coming from the American side on the Iran nuclear deal that there was flaws in the deal, there were holes in it, issues that were not addressed. And there was a genuine, converse, a real conversation happening with Europeans uh, in 2017 and into 2018 to try to strengthen the deal. And, but the decision was taken to pull out altogether. And I, I don't see that that has brought us closer. Um, similarly, I think on, uh, and again, we could attribute this atmospherics, but nevertheless, this is happening, the, the kind of debate about the U.S. commitment to NATO, a debate that regardless of the, of the, of the earnest 
rhetoric coming out from below the level of the president, um, that nevertheless is something that for very good reasons is on many people's minds about what would happen in a second term uh, if Trump were reelected vis-a-vis uh, -vis the U.S. and its commitment to Article 5, since the president's own personal views on the alliance are pretty well known and pretty, in my views, uh, indisputable uh, on this. The last point I should say on China, because I also I agree very much with Wes that this is an area that I think uh, we've seen growing convergence between the U.S. and Europe on on the acknowledgement of the of the threat from China, uh, and I think that that in part because of the the efforts of the U.S. government across two administrations to try to really uh, engage with the Europeans on uh, the challenges of the Asia Pacific, but China specifically. Also, if, let's face it, because of China's behavior, um, the Europeans now I think get it. I'll start, and maybe this makes Wes's answer easier. I don't think the damage is irreparable. Um, you know, yes, it's true. Things have been said that can't be unsaid. Uh, and I suppose there will always be lingers, lingering doubt in the minds of some European partners that, that uh, the, the, the vein that, that President Trump has tapped into uh, that expresses deep skepticism about alliances and, and their value to America's national interest and, and frankly, misunderstanding of alliances like NATO just in terms of how they operate, that that could always, that, that, that has always been within our bloodstream, uh, uh, those views, and, and they could always come back. But I, I actually look at this, maybe this is, this, I'll chalk this up to being a, an eternal optimist perhaps, but that, um, you know, we've, my European colleagues see the public opinion polling showing still overwhelming support for alliance like NATO, understanding that those alliances do have to work and that Europeans need to do their fair share uh, and as Wes pointed out earlier, the burden sharing debate is not going anywhere. Uh, in fact, it's probably only going to get harder as the economic crisis because of COVID settles in on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, but I, I think that uh, that a new administration, particularly if it's a President Biden, who is so well known in Europe, uh, who for decades has has worked in the trenches on this relationship, whether from Capitol Hill or from the from the executive branch. Um, and really understands it. Uh, I think there'll be there's you know a lot of a lot of the damage that has happened is not irreparable. Well, I agree with some of what Derek has said. I, I will say I I think some of this um, is substance, some of it is is tone, uh, but the reality is uh, from one administration to the next, I think there's often um, slippage, and in some ways. With the Obama administration, I think you had in Europe the appearance of engagement, but in some ways the reality of disengagement. Uh, and the opposite with the Trump administration, in some ways you've had the appearance of disengagement, but the reality of, of engagement. And uh, with Obama, it's important to, to remember, and, and uh, Derek alluded to a couple of these policy decisions, but uh, Obama came into office with uh, the decision to uh, uh, not move forward with the U.S. missile defense uh, sites in Poland and the Czech Republic. Uh, we had the pivot to Asia, which Derek mentioned. Obviously, the U.S.-Russia reset, which I think was very discomforting to a number of U.S. allies in Central Europe. Um, we withdrew the last BCTs from Europe. Uh, but the perception was that the administration was engaging more deeply in Europe. I think with the Trump administration, in some ways, as I said, you've had the opposite. We've had um, upwards of 150, 160 U.S.-led military exercises in Europe in the last few years, an increased tempo of U.S. diplomacy, as I mentioned a minute ago, in Central Europe, Western Balkans, Eastern Med. Um, so I think it's important to bear that in mind. I'll take a crack at that. I mean, I, as I said a minute ago, I think the main objective broadly for U.S. policy in Europe has to be to bring our relationships in that region into better alignment with the main U.S. strategic requirements for an era of great power competition. And I think this is where the national defense strategy has uh, outlined some objectives that will not be perishable for the United States. I think they're going to be with us for a while. And that also imposes some clarity and discipline in how we think about our policy in a lot of regions in the world, and certainly in Europe. 
Um, I think the, the, the main feature of great power competition is economic, diplomatic, you know, technological, ideological competition, particularly with China. And if you accept that premise, I think a couple of things follow for the United States in terms of our priorities in Europe. One, and I think it's the, it's the biggest one, is Western political cohesion. That we need strong alliances in Europe to give us the broadest possible political and economic base with which to compete with China, uh, both globally and in key regions. And, and to my mind, um, that implies the need for a US-Europe agenda that is more comprehensive than what we've talked about at pretty much any point since the end of the Cold War. It's not just trade, uh, but regulatory and ethical standards in emerging and disruptive technology. So there's definitely a, a strong digital component to that agenda that is underdeveloped. It's the reform of international institutions. So the WTO, for example, United Nations, when the United States and Europe jointly tackle what I think should be uh, a, a, a voluntary and a, and a proactive renovation of those institutions, it, we're stronger when we do that together. I think it's also military technological. Um, so for the United States through NATO, United States and Europe to uh, maintain a, a, a key edge in a lot of the technologies that will determine uh, uh, life and death and victory in, in, on the battlefield. The second priority, which that alludes to, and I think it's just as important, is military. And that is to ensure our ability to secure what would be a, probably a secondary theater in the event of uh, major conflict in order to enable U.S. forces to prioritize Asia. I can make this easy because I agree with with almost everything you've said. Uh, I mean, it seems to me, and I'll just underscore a couple of things that come to mind for me, which is obviously climate change is going to be, uh, should be first and foremost on the agenda. Um, and, you know, we don't, we, we as though we need further reminder of that, watching the, the, the wildfires in, on our West Coast here in the U.S. is just further evidence of the urgency of that issue. And let, we've lost a lot of time in the last few years on that, I think. Uh, and that's one that, that the U.S. and our European partners need to be leading on. Second and related to that, as we've discussed, is, is China. Um, and this is an area where I do think there is potential, uh, in part from the hard work done by U.S. administrations to Try to try to pull the Europeans uh, into the conversation a little more, but also they're being pushed there by Chinese behavior. Um, but whether it relates to the economic consequences of China's rise, the security aspects, and what what uh, we need to be thinking about militarily uh, if we were to uh, enter into some sort of uh, armed conflict with China, in and what that would mean for our security interests in Europe. It's a really important uh, uh, piece of business that we need to look into with the Europeans. And then finally, the democratic crisis in the United States, uh, we, are, we are still in the opening stages of. Uh, and a lot is gonna depend on if, if we were to have a change of administration, how the president, the current president handles that. Uh, uh, it's hard for me to see a, a scenario where we're gonna have what looks like a normal transition, you know, as, as we've become accustomed to. Um, um, and, uh, that is going to matter a lot for the transatlantic relationship. And I think that in some ways we need a democratic renewal, small d democratic renewal in the U.S. and in Europe. That's going to have to start here in the U.S. and, and uh, be, be sort of be part of the transatlantic conversation. Um, but the, 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 the three-headed crises that we're facing here, the, 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 the pandemic, the economic crisis uh, that's it's sparked by the pandemic, but it is, it is, accentuating uh, some structural issues that have been there all along in terms of the U.S. economy and the widening gap uh, between those at the top and those at the bottom. Um, and the racial reckoning, the, the, the reckoning that we're having with the systemic racism in the United States, uh, which is long overdue and it's, it's, it's demographically inevitable. Um, it's gonna be a, it's a huge impact on the future of U.S. foreign policy writ large, but particularly the transatlantic relationship.